Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. It's my pleasure to have a, a slider here on the um, uh, on the on the Zoom today to to talk about his experience with um, uh, protracted withdrawal. He has a really interesting story. Um, um, he was prescribed uh, benzodiazepine for PTSD, which I think is really common in our community. And then um, he, um, over time, has you know fairly fairly well kind of su successfully tapered off the medication, and has experimented with um, a range of really interesting treatment choices, such as psychedelics. I think he brings a really unique kind of perspective to the whole story. So. Um, we're really glad to have him here. I'm going to turn it over to Slider. Please go ahead and introduce yourself and then maybe uh, kick, kick it off with telling us about how you how you ended up uh, on a benzodiazepine. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I could do that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Doc. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my birth certificate says Mark on it. My mom calls me Mark. Most yeah. of my friends call me Slider, though. That's a Navy fighter community thing. That's kind of, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I'm just a guy walking around now. Um, yeah, how did I end up on uh, benzodiazepine? So I, I think you're right. Uh, I think a lot of uh, physicians do prescribe benzodiazepines for PTSD, uh, you know, innocently. Uh, you know, you can find plenty of, of uh, literature out there and, and there's, you know, a very prominent study by the VA. I think it was published in 2013 that talks about uh, you know, how it's contraindicated in PTSD for a whole slew of reasons. And that, you know, I experienced every, every one of those things. So yeah, that was a bad thing, but you know, a little bit uh, background on the PTSD. So there's lots of ways to get to the point where you meet the criteria for, for PTSD, you know, each case is unique. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of components to mine. Uh, you know, there are small traumas uh, that you accumulate through your life. Every, everyone does. And, you know, sometimes if the trauma is repeated over and over and over again, well, over time, it accumulates to be a big trauma. Sometimes there are huge traumas. And that's, you know, certainly part of my story. And I'll, I'll tell a brief version of that here in a minute. Um, but the point of all of that is, is there's a lot of pieces to it. Um, I think a very large piece that shouldn't be neglected is, uh, you know, what we're calling now uh, in the PTSD community, operator syndrome. So there's a distinction between, you know, PTSD that you see in, in the movies and, and, you know, what the majority of guys who are struggling after they get out of the structure of the military are, are dealing with. And, you know, to illustrate that, it, it's easy to understand that if I'm in a foxhole with, with uh, you know, the, my best friend and um, around goes through his helmet splatters brains all over my face. Well, th you know, that's obviously traumatizing and I'm likely to, you know, go home and wake up screaming in the middle of the night and, you know, be angry and abuse alcohol and, you know, all these, these things, you know, if you saw, saw the movie stand by me, my, my dad stormed the beaches in Normandy, right? That, that kind of PTSD. Mm -hmm. That's how I understood it. Um, uh, you know, I was well down, the road as, as someone with PTSD before I understood the, the more nuanced part of it, which is this operator syndrome. So, you know, when you become, uh, when you're in a combat environment or not even in a combat environment, I mean, you know, training for combat. So we're flying on and off aircraft carriers in bad weather in the dark. You know, we have to hit tankers. We, we drop weapons. We fight. We, we're on night vision goggles. We're pulling G's. We're disoriented. We're tired. We're dehydrated. We're all, all these things. It's just go. That life is just a go, go, go life. It's very intense. Um, and it has to do, be, you know, you're doing big, huge things in an environment where very small mistakes uh, can potentially deadly could have national security implications. Uh, and so you can't make, you can't make errors. And you got to make a lot of decisions very quickly. And some of those are very complex decisions with a lot of inputs and and you know so we train 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 to get so our uh you know our neurophysiology along with our psychology adapts to this so that we can mm -hmm. survive you know so we put this pressure on ourselves and a lot of it's survival instinct but what happens if you do this for years and years and years in the operational military 
is your your homeostasis, your quiescent level of, of, of neuro excitation. You just become adapted to this much higher level. You're, you're full throttle all the time. It's go, go, go. Um, you know, it's not even unpleasant when you're doing it. You have a big sense of purpose. You have a great team around you. Uh, everybody's a professional. Uh, you know, you're making big things happen. So you don't think it's a problem. It's, it's just what you have to do. You know, and that's a way of life. And so you spend 20 years doing things like that, particularly, you know, in my case, every time I deployed, we went to war. You know, I was in I was, you know, Desert Storm way, way back in the day. And, uh, you know, we were in Kosovo, Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. We were the first guys uh, in Afghanistan after 9-11. So it's just been, you know, one super high pressure event after another and and so what happens is that serves you very well and that keeps you alive it makes you effective in uh, in executing your mission but it's not useful when you get back because this neurophysiology this the changes in your psychology all this you bring it back with you and all of a sudden you're in this world where everything's moving at a snail's pace and people don't communicate efficiently and and you know, we're not all on the same page. We're not all trying to, to make the same thing happen. And so all these things that you're not used to, you are severely maladapted for normal life. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is the way I would say it. Um, you know, and there's, I mean, I could go on for hours about all these little traumas and how they accumulate and what the nature is. But see, some of it's relationship stuff. Some of it's, you know, things in my childhood. My parents aren't perfect. Too. They're very loving people, but, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of stuff like that. I had a very big one uh, that when I look back on my Navy career, uh, I, I can see was clearly a turning point in the way I behaved, the way I felt, the way I thought, the way I acted. Um, and that was in, uh, in 2005 in Iraq. Um, in 2005 in Iraq, so we had already, we already had control of Baghdad basically most of the country and the Marines were, were having a tough time out in Western Iraq and Fallujah. Everyone knows about, you know, how tough that was, but I was up, you know, we were flying off the aircraft carrier, flying air support missions. So basically we would just go fly around and, and just be there when guys on the ground needed a weapon or they needed a sensor to see something or they just needed a show of force, scare some guys off anything. We were just there on call, ready to do it. Um, the other thing that was going on at that point is, you know, the big maneuver, uh, warfare stuff was over. I mean, we had control of the streets mostly. What we were doing was trying to, uh, you know, put together terrorist networks. We we're trying to figure out who are the bad guys, where do they live, who do they communicate with, all this stuff. So because of that, we were putting a lot of bombs in the populated areas. Um, of course, when you're doing that, the collateral damage becomes a huge concern. So, uh, you know, when we showed up there, we were using some what I would say now, some maybe outdated tactics, techniques, and procedures, we call them TTPs, uh, for delivering this particular laser guided weapon uh, that I was using that night. And, and, you know, seeing that the nature of our mission had changed, how much more important collateral damage had become. Uh, and as the strike operations officer for our carrier air wing, so that's all the airplanes on the ship, you know, part, one of my, part of my job was to advise the air wing commander on how we should use these weapons to be most effective and i just saw some things about the way we were doing business that, that i believed were going to lead to a problem now i did my very best to convince uh, my commanding officer who's a great guy a very smart guy uh, the deputy air wing commander as well I, you know i can't say anything bad about anyone in that organization these are good people these are professionals they're they're competent they do the right thing even when it's hard uh, you know, these guys are great fighter pilots. I mean, I, it's just one of those things that happens in systems with humans. It, it, they're just not perfect. So I want to be very clear about that. But I was unable to convince him that we should deviate from the Navy standard tactics that we'd been using for these things. And, and you know, I had some experience that he hadn't as a young guy. I had, had dropped a lot of these, mostly in Kosovo and around um, or in Afghanistan. Um, and you know, he didn't have that experience. Um, so for whatever reason, I was unable to convince him that we should change the way we were doing business. And, you know, it just happened to work out that, um, 
you know, it was time to deliver a bomb. And, and this concern that I had was, was relevant. Uh, you know, I was the guy in command. So there we were. I, I put this bomb down, uh, trying to get some bad guys. And these were bad guys. We, we caught them red-handed. Um, but I used the technique that uh, I was ordered to use and not the one that I believed was morally correct. So as a result of that, the bomb did exactly what I was trying to convince my airman commander was you know, a possible bad outcome. And we hit a house next door and killed about a dozen innocent people. So, you know, I, I'm not a Marine. I wasn't kicking doors. In. I didn't put a knife through somebody's skull or anything like that. I didn't see any gore. You know, it's a little bit impersonal uh, in the airplane, but um, you know, I went back to the ship. We analyzed my tapes. They said I did everything right. Uh, it was just one of those things. And you know, that's what I was told. Uh, but in, internally, I didn't accept uh, and, and you know, I didn't even know what moral injury was at that point. I, I learned that years, years later. A guy, uh, Bob, Dr. Bob Kaufman, is a great American former Navy flight surgeon, does a lot of work with uh, uh, Hope for Reason, uh, which is General Steele's uh, Reason for Hope, Hope for Reason. It's a General Steele's organization that's trying to legalize and deschedule all this stuff mm -hmm. for, for veterans. So, uh, you know, he talked to me about moral injury, and I realized my story has. Not just that one, but there's numerous moral injuries. So what's a moral injury? You know, this is mm -hmm. one of those, uh, you know, in my case, it was someone I trusted very, you know, completely. Uh, I don't want to say betrayed my trust, but but I was disappointed. Uh, you know, over and over again, there, there's just a bunch of events in my life where that happened. And, you know, this is a big one. I believed it was a moral imperative that we do business a different way. And I, I did my very best to, to make that case and was told to stop. So, mm -hmm. you know, once it came to fruition, as, as predicted, well, there was my moral injury. Um, and, you know, I, I was less angry uh, because I know these guys were, doing what they thought was right uh, and if I recall, than I was than I was about that it happened it's yeah. just that it happened you know and you were in a really difficult position because if you deviated from the standard guidelines for how to drop those bombs I mean for such an important task I mean you were taking out a, a you know like a some really bad guys and if you had done it in a different way and it had failed somehow I mean what would have been the consequences for you and I guess your career yeah, so there's there's the you know there was the dilemma in the cockpit because you know I was very passionate about making this argument. I, I went in there over and over and over again trying to present it different ways. I even got some help from another guy, who, mm -hmm. you know, a top gun graduate. You know, we we just couldn't make the case. But it came to the point where the deputy airing commander told me, you know, slider, stand down. The answer is no. Go about your business. You know, and I said, mm -hmm. hi, sir. I mean, I had to. That was, so there's a direct order from, you know, yeah. an officer in my chain of command. Uh, you know, the professional answer is, aye, aye, sir. And you go do it. And there's just no no question, you know, but we're human beings. And so, you know, my concern in the cockpit was, okay, we're about to drop this bomb. I have a choice. And it's, it has to do with when we turn a laser on and all that stuff. And I had control of that. And I said, you know, when do I turn a laser on? Do I turn it on at the time that I believe is most likely to cause this weapon to be effective and minimize collateral damage, or do I want to do it the way that I've been ordered to do it? And you know, that's a tough choice because if I do it the way I've been ordered to do it, even if the bad thing I predicted happens, I'm covered. I'm, uh, I'm not in trouble, at least in the military structure. Internally, I have a problem, but, but at least my career is in harm. Um, you know, if I do it my way and the bomb, goes well the delivery goes well well i've proved nothing now i've just <laughs> violated a direct order and i've proved nothing that's probably a you know an ass chewing and maybe sitting on the bench for but if i do it my way and it misses anyway you know potentially end up in, in leavenworth i mean i i would expect it i would absolutely be benched 
probably sent home from deployment. I mean, that that's very possible. Could end up in prison. So, you know, the stakes here are huge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, so this, this event happens. Um, and, you know, like you said, you know, a lot of people can develop PTSD simply from being in a highly stressful environment for years where the nervous system adapts. It sounds like you had that going on probably throughout your whole career, maybe before and even after that event. And then you have this other event, which, you know, is clearly, clearly, clearly traumatic on several different levels. Um, how did, how did this affect you? Um, I guess in your personal life, when you, when you went back home? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I was I was married at, at the time to a you know beautiful, loving woman. I had two wonderful sons with her, and they you know they were there at that at that time. Um, you know, when I look back uh, a week or two after that incident, um, you know, I was I was in the office on the ship, and I, I sent an email to my my wife. You know, you're not really allowed to talk a whole lot about what's going on, but you know, you let them know you're alive. You know, I miss you, I love you, all that stuff. And so I went for the nightly email and she had said something about, you know, I'm really looking forward to you coming home. We only had a couple more months of deployment. She said, you know, I'm really looking forward to you coming home. And I answered, you know, just instinctively, I wrote, I don't want to come home. And I hit send and I wouldn't think, you know, I was just in a hurry and I didn't think much about it. And I hit that. And I remember laying in the rack that night saying, how'd that come from? This has got to be very upsetting to my beautiful young wife, you know? Um, and I didn't really understood that, understand that it was many years later that I figured it out in the therapist's office, but I, you know, I came home, um, yeah, you're always wound up when you get back from employment. I mean, it's normal to have a couple of weeks where you just got to kind of decompress and wind down. Um, you know, I attempted to do that, but didn't really get there. Um, this time was a little different. That was my third deployment in the Navy. I didn't play in the Air Force previously, but. I was in third Navy deployment, and it, it was very different. Uh, when I came home, I never relaxed. Um, I, you know, I, I, I talk about being an afterburner all the time. I mean, I just could not slow down. Um, a lot of it was good. You know, I used that energy to, to accomplish a lot of stuff, things around the house, things, you know, a little bit years down the road when I was getting ready to get out, I started building the business on the side. You know, I was very effective at that because I, you know, was operating at 105% all the time. I barely slept. Um, you know, I felt good. I felt happy. I felt like I was a great guy. I was, I was just doing huge things. I was moving mountains daily. Like it was no big deal. It was this massive thing. Um, but some other things, you know, happened that, I only can see clearly in retrospect, which is, you know, my relationship with my wife there, that we never really fully reconnected the way we should have. As a matter of fact, I didn't even talk to her much about that bomb. I, I think I told her about it, but it wasn't a big issue. I mean, I kind of just put it in a box and left it there, just like all the other things that I had put in boxes and left there. And this is typical, uh, you know, guys, particularly working in combat environment, but, it, you know, any any place where compartmentalization is necessary to, to be mm -hmm. safe and effective. So, uh, you know, we get really, really good at that. So looking back, I realized there are a lot of things bothering me that I never talked to her about. So some of it was, you know, choices we made as a family and, you know, career stuff and relationship stuff and all, you know, all that. But um, I think I started drinking a little. Now I thought I was having fun. Hey, hey buddies. Mm -hmm. Yay, this is great. You know, I look back and I go. It was too much about the drink and not enough about the socialization. Um, you know, I look back at some of my habits, how many drinks do I have before I go out and meet my friends? You know, it used to be zero. You know, eventually I got to, I, I got to be buzzed with the alcohol before I even go out and hang out with my friends. And then I drink too much and, you know, bars close and let's have some shots. Hey, I'm the funnest guy in the street. I really thought I was having fun. I wasn't. What I was doing is not dealing with all those elephants in those boxes um you know i see that clearly and then you know some some time went on and 
you know, my wife eventually came to me and said, you know, we went to marriage counseling, a couple of years of marriage counseling. She finally came to me and said, you know, Mark, we have this beautiful life. You know, we built this nice house. We have these two kids. She's a great job. I have a great job. Everything looks great. She goes, we have this great life. I'm very happy. We have everything I need. I'm tired of you being unhappy. Well, you know, now when I say that out loud, I almost laugh because I should have gone, well, here's why I'm unhappy. Bam, 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 bam. I mean, it was big stuff. But at that point, it had accumulated a lot. Um, and I wasn't able to talk. About it. And I didn't see things that way. And, um, you know, she wanted a trial separation. And when she said that, you know, to me, my gut reaction was, hey, there's a stressor off my plate. Yeah. What an awful thing. I mean, this is my family. It's my children. I mean, this is the purpose of my life. You know, I mean, this, but at that time, I was just so wound up that I was just like, uh, all right, you're gonna, you want to separate? Bye. And mm -hmm. I never looked back. I didn't try to fix my family. I mean, this was a tragedy of massive proportion. So, you know, that made, made things worse. And when that happened, you know, now I'm outside the structure of, uh, you know, my marriage, I'm about to be outside the structure of, of the Navy and all this stuff. So everything that's enabling me to, to keep myself together is just slowly falling away piece, piece by piece by piece. And then, you know, the last straw was, you know, I mentioned the structure of the Navy. So now I'm an, you know, an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm doing my own thing. That was okay because the jobs I had in front of me were so big. It was almost like combat building a business from the ground up, especially when you're developing new technology and, and all this stuff. Briefly, I've been a heavy equipment operator for some decades, mm -hmm. you know, and all of a sudden I'm an entrepreneur. Um, you know, that was, that was okay, but it was just, it was just more stress. So you get that structure of the day gone. Now I bring a, you know, a new relationship into my life that, you know, again, was very unhealthy for me. I'm mm -hmm. just making a lot of bad choices here, you know. I, yeah. And it's because I'm I'm not able to make good ones. I mean, you're just operating in a bar. You know, it, imagine driving down the interstate and, and, you know, the rain starts and you can barely see. Is it you speed up? No. <laughs> you slow mm -hmm. down and you go, okay, I need to figure out what's going on here. That didn't happen to me. I just went more throttle good it's just go you know uh and so i got you know problem after problem after problem and you know i chose a very uh chose the wrong person to be in an, in a you know an intimate relationship with and uh you know that was kind of the last that was the last straw because she just made everything twice as as bad you know i was getting through my day but i'd come home and i had to deal with this stuff uh and that eventually culminated in a single panic attack and i didn't know what a panic attack was mm -hmm. you know uh we were having a conversation and she said something particularly awful to me and all of a sudden my heart started pounding i started sweating I started hyperventilating felt dizzy the room was just spinning around me i mean i just got tightness in my chest i thought i was having a heart attack you know i i didn't know what a panic attack I thought it was a weak-minded excuse yeah. for, for, for you know, that not keeping your act together or something. That, that's not it. That's not yeah. it at all. The arrogance of that is, is, all, is humorous at this point. No, it, when you get that stressed out, it's it's just a physiological reaction. I mean, it's it's just normal. You you've overwhelmed your your uh, you know your neurophysiology. Um, mm -hmm. So that happened and. You know, I, I I called a doctor that I had, I had his number on the phone, and wham, he threw me on, on uh, 0. 0.5 milligrams of Ativan four times a day, um, mm. right out of right out of the gate. Now, I had never heard the word benzodiazepine, or if I had, it didn't register or benzo. I didn't know these terms. Uh, I was vaguely aware that Ativan was some kind of tranquilizer, but didn't really. To be honest, the state I was in at that point, I wasn't the guy who was going to pull the, the insert out and read five pages of stuff. I think that's how much it was in was it? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, who reads those things anyway? Um, yeah, because you trust you trust your doctor to give you the most important information about it when you go there, right? Because you have a trusting right. relationship with them. Yeah, so this is another this is another moral injury. 
right? Yeah. So I'm, I mean, I think I'm dying. I call this guy for help and he puts me on this stuff. I feel better right away. I'm grateful. Thanks, Doc. You know, I went to the right guy. And, and there, so was I there any discussion it. about like um, some of the more traditional uh, therapies for PTSD, you know, like, you know, the different types of um, exposure therapies and, and, and things like that? Um, or, you know, or even a conversation like, hey, you know, Mark, why don't you come in? Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in your life before we kind of jump into this. Did, did you get any of that? Sadly, I did not. Um, and again, I didn't, you know, I was a guy who would never take a psych med. I mean, no way. <laughs> Just no way, you know, aspirin and vitamins. Um, you know, counseling, marriage counseling had been been really good. I, I learned a lot about myself in a couple of years of marriage counseling. You know, I went in there and did the work and I, that was very powerful. I absolutely believe that the talk therapy, if you make a real commitment to it and you find the right person, uh, it can be very powerful in it. And I'd seen that, but I, you know, I just wasn't open to doing a lot of deep personal work or anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just a puffed up fighter guy, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very unhealthy once you get outside of that environment. Um, so I did not seek counseling. The guy I called, uh, it was interesting. So in my marriage counseling sessions, uh, you know, theme from my wife is I'm tired of him being unhappy. I'm tired of being, well, there's lots of normal reasons for me to be unhappy. You know, depression is normal. This is something we got to get over. Bad things happen to you. Being depressed is normal. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you got to acknowledge that and, and figure out why and try to change some things and, and dig your way out of it. I mean, that's just life, right? To, so to be unhappy isn't, you know, I need to be medicated. I figure out why you're unhappy first, right? And it's as obvious to me now. But, um, you know, in those counseling sessions, she, my wife had convinced the counselor, and this was an LCSW, licensed clinical social worker. Very good. One, good wonderful woman. Um, you know, she, they decided they thought I should be on antidepressants. And they pushed and pushed and pushed. And I fought them and fought them and fought them. And it just over months and months, it got so they were so insistent that I said, fine, I'll give it a try. So she suggested this guy who prescribed the Ativan. He's a psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, pr in private practice, very expensive. This guy's the best. Um, so I was paying out of pocket. And you know, I went to this guy and he put me on Lexapro, uh, I think, for a couple of months. Hated it. I mean, I hated just the idea of it to begin with. Uh, and that was without the understanding of you know, what I just discussed about depression. But I just didn't like the idea of being on the segment. And I felt weird. I just felt mm -hmm. off. I just didn't feel right. And so I gave it a go for a couple of months to, to mostly to appease these other people. And, you know, then I got right back off of it. I, it was clearly not for me. So that's why I had the guy's number in my phone. Sure. Okay. And that had been a couple years earlier. Now he's a psychiatrist. So, you know, when I had this panic attack, why did I call him? I, I, it's not even clear to me why I called him. I mean, when you're having a panic attack, I mean, you're just spinning. So, you know, I don't know. But for whatever reason, I picked up my phone and this guy's number was the one I found. And I, and I called him. And so as a psychiatrist, he did, did what a psychiatrist does. Now, he mm -hmm. wrote me a script. So he wrote me the script. He said, run down to the pharmacy, get this right away. You need it instantly. And he was right. I, it was great stuff in that moment. It, it helped me. I felt better. Panic attack was over by the time I the med but it helped and i said make an appointment come come and see me in a couple of weeks and we'll figure this out so you know a week or two on ativan is okay um you know if you look at the package insert this is not for long-term use two weeks you know i think is the recommended maximum and i think that's right there are plenty of stories of people who use this stuff for two weeks and have difficult withdrawal yep and this stuff is <laughs> that powerful i mean your body just fights against this stuff you know it, it undermines it it counteracts it i mean your, your your physiology will just fight this stuff off and that's where the dependence and uh you know tolerance come from and all the other other problems but so that was okay but when i got in there you know i spent an hour talking to him about you know how do you think you got here all that stuff 
you know, it's sad. I don't want to sit here and say this is a bad human being. I don't sure. want to say this. He's a very, he's a nice guy. I like him. I think he means well. He'd been in practice for a long time. He was respected. He was able to charge 250 bucks an hour. You know, I, and I was going for hour sessions. We talked. He didn't just, I just just walk in and write a script. So this made me feel a little more comfortable, but he really wasn't mm -hmm. much of a calendar. I think he was fascinated with my story, to be honest with you. I mean, it's kind of sick. I, I think in a way, maybe he was entertained. I don't, I don't know. Only he knows that. But, you know, I went in there and told him all these things. He just kept writing me the script. So every 90 days, I would go in there and give him an update. And he would write me another script, 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 script. And this went on and on for four and a half years. And so over four and a half years, as my tolerance built, and I was in constant tolerance withdrawal, I, I had all the classical effects. And you know, I, I, I want to jump now. I want to jump in here because it to me it seems like a nice uh, parallel, I guess. Um, um, you know, when 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 we're talking about the medical model and prescribing in psychiatry, I mean, the thing that comes to my mind, you know, when I hear your story about dropping bombs, you know, it's not it's not the same thing, but you know, I, like I remember being in residency and being told to do things that I didn't really want to do. You know, that was around about the time I was learning about protracted withdrawal, different injuries from antidepressants. And um, I, I kind of, you know, you, you would bring things up to your leadership and uh, you know, I was kind of treated by an annoyance by some of them, not by all of them, but it was because they're so, you know, they're so ingrained in a way of doing things. I mean, there are practice guidelines, you know, if someone has three depressive episodes, the guideline is to keep them on an antidepressant for life, you know, like they, you know, so there's some really kind of rigid concrete things in there. And um, you might say, you might evaluate someone who's on an antidepressant, they're getting worse. They look like they're developing some bipolar disorder, maybe some mood elevation instead of, you know, I might see that person and say, Hey, I really think this person's having an adverse reaction to it, to the antidepressant. It fits the time course, but you know, I would be working with someone else and then they would say, oh, you know, no, this is probably just a bipolar disorder. You know, they talk to them for like two seconds, you know, just say, you know, their symptoms match, no, no kind of consideration for other factors there. And then kind of overrule this person would end up on an antipsychotic, just compounding the problem. And I have to say, I, I nearly wanted to quit. I mean, for, for a good, you know, it took me a while to kind of figure it out, but I mean, this was kind of probably, you know, my third and fourth, fourth year, mostly my third year of um, my training was just, this was happening all the time. I was getting in trouble for being mouthy about things as well. And, you know, bringing up my problems, but it was, yeah, essentially being I in a force. Yeah. 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 You know, being in a, <laughs> a situation where you're kind of, you're trapped and you're kind of, for, you know, pressured to do things that you feel are ethically wrong. So, I mean, that, you know, the structure of kind of the medical the medical field and how hierarchical it is. And then also with, um, you know, the, the military, I think your experience is probably pretty common in the military, especially in, in you know, yeah. It, it is. Yeah. And you know, my, my story is kind of sexy because it's got fighter jets and bombs and all yeah. this guy. It's not an unusual story at all. I, I mean, fill in yeah. the details differently, but I mean, my story is a typical story as a matter of fact, it's a shame I got on the ad of, uh, you know, particularly since we know now that I'm in that 10 to 15 percent cohort that is exquisitely sensitive um but you mentioned something there that i think is super important i am not an md <laughs> you you know you are so so talk to this but uh, are you familiar with peter bregan dr peter bregan oh yeah I've, I've read his book on psychiatric drug withdrawal yeah right so he talks yeah. in there he talks about the mm -hmm. big pharma influence on how physicians are trained um, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm fascinated by people who grab on to all that stuff, but I, I don't think this is a conspiracy. You know, he makes a very good case for it is that, you know, pharma wants, uses their influence to affect the way that, that physicians are trained. Well, physicians should be a scientist. You know, it looks to me like we've gotten away from this. I mean, a physician is a scientist. You should your, your curiosity, the methods of inquiry. I mean, you're taught all this stuff. It, you know, it, why aren't you allowed to, to exercise that? You know, why do, why do people feel so constrained by these guidelines that, that could completely take the scientist out of the position? 
I think that's kind of interesting. And um, anyone that who's has, who's been in the corporate world or even the military, um, you know, yeah, I, I went into school kind of thinking in that way. And then over time, you learn that, you know, if you if you bring that that maybe a more um, questioning mindset to things, it doesn't work out too well for you. I feel like a lot of times it's really it's it's social. It's almost like a you know corporate culture and things like that. You know, and and it was almost it it's like being a good team player. You know, becomes what ends up being the thing that's you know linked to your success obviously you need to be able to be technically competent in the way that they want you to be you know but most of it ends up being um being easy to get along with and so some of those attributes that you mentioned being questioning being scientific i mean if you've got 30 patients to see in one day and otherwise they're going to blow out and you have three months until you can get your next follow-up appointment it's like there's not a lot of time for questioning you need to go in there you need to get it done and um, maybe we'll talk about it later. And I, for me, this was like a big realization because, you know, and it and it's sad in a way because it kind of pushed me from being more questioning to just saying, I need to keep my head down for a little bit. Eventually, I'll be out on my own. I can do things my way. But that was kind of, um, you know, my kind of, uh, you know, w- wake up. This is kind of how the world works. You know, it's it's a lot about relationships. It's a lot about getting on with people. You know, you're here, you're a physician, you know, do no harm, you know. And so you're getting this, you're getting these, you know, this lip service to that. But then what you're seeing on the ground is it's kind of like production line medicine. You know, what you're seeing and you're feeling is it's more about being easy to work with and getting along with. And so it's very conflicting. I, I mean, <laughs> it was something that I certainly struggled with a lot. But I mean, now, so now I'm out of my, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a systemic problem. This is a, the structure of the system it does not, uh, it's not an environment that, it, that incentivizes the most desirable behaviors being you know, good outcomes for patients. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what you're telling me is that the organization has to function. You, you've got, you know, you have a financial consideration. I mean, your office has to make, you know, see some mm-hmm. okay, patients these data, pay the bills. And these are very practical things. Um you know, the pharma companies aren't incentivized to make sure that you're looking for reasons to stop prescribing their product. I don't think they mm-hmm. sat in their secret lair and made a big, you know, plan to take over medical education. I and mean, it just kind of happens. You know, people yeah. are opportunists. There are people, very smart people are in sales and marketing and all. And it, and it you know, it just kind of got there. But, you know, to tie that all back to what we're talking about, my prescribing physician didn't know that dependence and tolerance were a problem with benzodiazepines. I know this because of my numerous follow-up conversations with him. He didn't know. He didn't know to look for anything. He wouldn't have known what to look for. He had no idea. He didn't know about the possible, uh, you know, the severity of, of withdrawal. I mean, he mm-hmm. essentially cold turkey. Um, you know, it took me off of, you know, I was on there two milligrams a day, four and a half years. He tap- tapered me off over like four weeks. And I went nuts. I mean, I'm going to do violent acute withdrawal. I probably should have gone to the emergency room. I wish I had um, for documentation because there's, you know, a whole other issue that comes up is <laughs> you know, this is malpractice. Uh, I was not able to, you know, use our legal system to to get justice because, you know, two years after that cold turkey, I was barely putting my pants on in the morning. I wasn't able to to file a lawsuit. I wasn't able to go see an expert witness. I, I stopped making money. I mean, it wasn't working. I, you know, and so, you know, the statute of limitations came and went. Mm-hmm. I, there's no way I could have done. I mean, I was boxed out by the system there. That was a terrible, terrible thing too. Um, you know, so I did. I, you know, it occurred to me that you know if people start winning lawsuits malpractice lawsuits for these things uh the insurance companies are gonna that's a big signal to them right they're gonna see a hazard for them and that will incentivize them to make sure that physicians are educated by this because they don't want these things to happen right i Um, think it's it's, i think it's already a few cases yeah well one yeah one just happened yeah right like a month ago yeah that was uh, i i helped out with that case and um 
you know, I was, and I can't mention, I guess, who the defendant was, but I recently reviewed their updated uh, benzodiazepine prescribing guideline, which they give out to all their physicians. And, and there's changes, there's changes in there, you know, because they're saying, you know, we don't want to pay, you know, six figure set, you know, six figure settlements anymore. So, you know, now they have guidelines and, and, you know, this was a big healthcare provider in the U S you know, thousands of doctors. I mean, and, and if you can get these results with other people, then, you know, the lawyers there, you know, who are paid to play defense, you know, make sure the organization keeps on running, you know, they're going to get their quality guys out there making manuals, making sure that physicians do yearly trainings on these things and they have to sign off. And it kind of gets into that corporate structure where you start seeing more of these, um, you know, these things to kind of slow it down. So um, I totally think you're right. I mean, if if we can get, if, if there's, if we can get a couple more results, it'll, you know, the lawyers will do what they're paid to do. You know, they're going to protect their, their institutions. And I mean, it's sad, but ultimately protect patients through good quality care as well. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's going to be the nice byproduct of it. I, I, yeah. I hope so. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm certainly not a litigious guy, but, uh, you know, a great injustice was done here. And, you know, I know, I know you've listened to some of my podcasts about the psychedelic medicine and all that stuff. You know, my suffering is a gift. I have come to that conclusion that, you know, some good is coming out of a better person. And, you know, I'm on my path and doing what I have to do. But a lot of damage was done. I mean, the yeah, amount let, of suffering let, I've endured and, and financial damage, too. Uh, my, you know, my, my relationships with my children have suffered. I, I mean, just. The damage is big. Yeah, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, what were your symptoms of protracted withdrawal? Um, and do you want, uh, okay, you want to talk about the withdrawal or do you want to talk about before I got off? Because my symptoms before I got off, there's two sets of symptoms. Okay. So you do have, you have a set of symptoms while you're still on it and your intolerance withdrawal. There's actually three phases for me. Sure. Really. There's, there's, you know, the accumulated paradoxical effects that's from tolerance withdrawal that was one phase the cold turkey i went into about seven months uh kind of rocking back and forth in a dark room that's my cold turkey phase uh wow. that that's yeah. a that's a different phase uh then i got on the you know we did the diazepam placement mm -hmm. i found uh, dr mike bohan who's on the board of uh Sure. Yeah. No. Uh, the BIC. Yeah. Now, yeah, you know him. He was my physician. I'm very lucky. I found that man. You know, he'd been doing this for a long, long time. He, he's a, a scientist for sure, mm -hmm. and and a truly compassionate guy. And you know, I was very lucky to find him because he guided me through this stuff. Um, you know, when you look on these boards, most people can't find it. Out. But you know, that phase was unique. And then, you know, once I got off of those things. Um, once I got off the diazepam, which took a couple of years, um, you know, now I'm in the, what I hope is the final phase. It's just all the, the healing and, and, uh, you know, uh, neurological care, but you know, probably the worst thing about the whole thing is that I would say my biggest trauma, and I've got some big ones. I and mean, I just told you about one, the biggest trauma in my life is the benzodiazepine. The suffering I went through, I mean, I, I lost, I mean, I'm still putting myself back together. I mean, about seven years of my life uh, were, were, you know, severely damaged. Um, and those are some of the most productive, you know, I'm 55 years old now. I mean, those should have been the most productive years mm -hmm. of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm just, just, just back to the, you know, I, I say I'm at the walk phase now of, of crawl, walk, run. I'm kind of dusting off the last of the debris and I'm starting to walk uh, as mm -hmm. far as functioning in my life. So, I mean, that's a huge chunk of a human life there. I mean, it is traumatic. The, the, the intensity of the suffering is, is difficult to describe, you know, I'd not to take any way from anything, you know, away from these great, great guys who were in the Hanoi Hilton, but it's like, I just spent five years in the Hanoi Hilton. I mean, it's, I think it's comparable in, in magnitude to that. So, you know, anyone who makes it through, you know, you're a, you're a boss, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to power through the people who survive it. You guys are awesome. So if you're listening to this and you're going through this, don't give up um, mm -hmm. for sure. But 
you want to talk about symptoms so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so what were you yeah so after you got off the medications and i guess you went through you know the the seven the seven months of rocking back and forth in a dark room doing nothing and things kind of settled what were the worst residual symptoms that you were having i guess i guess which you still have you know seven years from now you know some people talk about ear ringing some people have burning skin neurological pain some people are just so tightly wound up with kind of anxiety um some people are fatigued i i want to know what flavor of that 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 you had to contend with for the last several years um yeah going forward okay great yeah um you know i read that the first thing i came across when I was trying to figure out what the heck was wrong with me, it took me a minute to figure out that it was the benzodiazepine, that I had to figure out what the benzodiazepine was, and then what, you know, what the mechanisms of action. I mean, I really needed to understand this because I couldn't trust anybody. By the way, one of the symptoms was acute paranoia. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Now, is it paranoid? Am I paranoid if my doctor was trying to kill me? No, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not after me, right? So, mm-hmm. um, but but that was tough. So that I I couldn't trust a physician. So that paranoia was a, a big one, um, and that's pretty much gone at this point. But through the stretch of of my taper, um, yeah, there's a whole slew of symptoms. So sleep disturbances are a huge one. Getting to sleep is very very difficult, and it's. You know, if I woke up at any time during the night, getting back to sleep was almost impossible. Uh, you know, a few years of that. Um, fatigue. Just no energy. Uh, you know, like lifelong athlete. I mean, right before the, the cold turkey, I mean, I was running six, you know, six miles a day, at seven, seven thirty pace. I mean, we're, you know, fast athletic stuff. I got to the point where I was off the couch maybe three hours a day. I just didn't have any energy. I mean, I just couldn't do anything but lay there. I didn't want to watch TV. I didn't want to, couldn't read because I couldn't focus. Um, so the fatigue is, is a huge one. Because even if my head was clear, I still wouldn't be able to do much. Cognitive fog. Uh, you know, you could spend an hour talking about the elements of, of what I call cognitive fog. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'll try to give a couple examples. Um, I remember near the end of my taper so from the cold turkey to the end of my taper was about two and a half years i remember maybe six eight months before the end of my taper someone said their phone number to me 10 digit phone number and i didn't have a piece of paper and i was panicking because i knew i couldn't remember it for long and i found a piece of paper and a pen and it was probably 30 seconds and i wrote the number was correct that was a big day in my life huge up to remember a 10 digit phone number now remember that you know i was a, I was a professional aviator you know I, i'd be in the airplane with all kinds of things going on navigating you know sensors you know noise multiple radios all this stuff but, you know a controller would come up and say you know gunfighter 22 turn right heading 230 just send maintain 17 thousand local altimeter two nine or nine or two switch uh you know atlanta center one two three four five i mean something like that and it's fast i would rattle all that right back to a guy i wouldn't even think twice about it. i mean that was my job that's at the point where i can remember a simple phone number. you know so i mean right there that's huge um problem solving so uh you know i have some some uh, post I was working on a PhD in electrical engineering in the Navy. Um, and so, you know, I'm a master of spreadsheets. I could do anything in a spreadsheet. I had this uh, lacrosse league I was working for, and we wanted to come up with a, a formula and imp- implement the RPI. It's just a numerical formula that ranks teams against each other. Uh, it's a little spreadsheet you have to put together. Nothing cosmic. I mean, this isn't calculus. It, mm-hmm. It's literally arithmetic. It took me five days to get this stupid spreadsheet to work right. And the, the frustration was massive. And, you know, I would look at a formula and for a few seconds at a time, I could get my head around it. I could grasp 
what's going on. I could visualize, you know, the mechanics of, of the math. Um, and then it would slip away and evaporate. I would start making a change in the spreadsheet. And I'm like, crap, what was I doing? Couldn't, I couldn't hang on to a thought. Um, you know, cognitively, what else? Uh, racing thoughts. Just like really bad attention deficit. I couldn't focus on anything for more than a minute or two at a time. And I was thinking about 10 different things. I, I mean, I was bouncing off the walls like, like flubber. Um, mm -hmm. It was terrible. And the energy, uh, the anxiety, the hyperactivity uh, was really bad. Um, you've got benzo belly. That's a thing. Uh, and I am no different than the majority of folks who say that, you know, your belly is the last thing to heal. Um, you know, as we figured out in, in recent years, the, the, the gut biome, the, the neuro neurology of the gut is very, very important in your mood. Uh, and your energy levels and other things uh, that is all disrupted as well you know there's there's gamma alpha receptors in your gut neurons right so that all that physiology is altered so it's very interesting uh particularly through that seven month period before i got on the diazepam i had constant craving to put something in my belly i wanted starchy stuff heavy stuff my belly just wanted something in it and so i ate like crap i mean i i went from 195 pounds of you know lean muscle to 255 pounds of, of wow you know blubber uh i i was just eating constantly and i couldn't get off the couch i mean that's what happens uh and there's other weird symptoms so so here's one uh numbness in my face as a matter of fact right now we've been speaking for a while Right, all mm -hmm. this talking for me, it's a little excitatory. This part of my face, all through here, my gums and part of my tongue on this side are all numb right now. This is typical. So, if I talk for a while, I get that. If I have some refined sugar, if I took a half a teaspoon of sugar, threw it down the hatch, within minutes, my face would be numb over here. Same thing with caffeine. Um, you know, I don't drink coffee anymore, I just drank my mud water. Uh, a bunch of mushrooms in there and all this stuff, new, new tropics. Um, I think we'll end up talking about that with the psychedelics. But, you know, even tiny bits of caffeine. I mean, a, a cup of decaf, my face goes numb. Uh, you know, I've just in recent months really started getting back into running and lifting weights. Um, this is a great, great thing. I really need that. By the way, if you want to fight your depression off, get fresh air and sunshine. Go do some exercise. I mean, it's really that simple mm -hmm. diet changes and, and things like that. I mean, the formula for wellness is not that complicated. We've just lost it in these, these complicated four weeks. You know? uh, so I'm, I'm working on that stuff. But if I, you know, I get two blocks away on my run, my face goes numb. It's bizarre. My face goes numb. No more anything. The other indicator, uh, well, when I'm having, you know, my symptoms are flaring up that goes right along with this. And it's a very uh, high fidelity indicator. It's my tinnitus. It is absolutely. And I noticed this very, very early on in the process. My, my tinnitus is it's like a VU meter. And, and it, what it's indicating is what's my level of neuro excitation. It, it's brilliant. You know, I mean, you could put something on my ear that goes like this. It's tell you how excited I am, but it just comes up and the tinnitus when it's bad, you know, if I, if I, you know, slammed a cup of coffee, went ran around the block once, my tinnitus would be screaming. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I say, you know, it's like I, I was standing in front of the speakers at the Van Halen concert and, and just walked out of the parking lot. I mean, it's a, it's, it's bad. It's getting better. You know, it's that bad less frequently and it stays that bad for less time. Uh, you know, just like the waves and the windows that everyone talks about through the withdrawal process. You know, each of my symptoms has, has, has waves and windows. And some of them correlate in their orbits now. I, I would say earlier on in the process, um, there's a website I found. It's a badbenzos.org. Uh, if you haven't, you know that one, Cass's story? Mm -hmm. It's a great one. That was the first thing I found that brought me into this benzo world. Is Cass's story? Uh, it's it's a 
tragedy of this is a, a you know a young woman who couldn't make it through and, and ended up ending her life but before she did that she wrote a couple of letters that are uh just really spectacular she writes a letter to to lay people or friends and family and she writes another letter to to physicians and she goes into great detail about her symptoms and when i read that story i mean every little detail what she said she was experiencing resonated with me because i went through all the same same things and what she that that gift she gave to the world be, before she left it was uh, get a little choked up it, it was a big deal uh so when i found cass's story one of the things that that really stuck in my brain is she talks about uh you know her solar system i think i forget the term she's but she talks about her solar system of symptoms and and each symptoms in its own orbit you know and they all go around and sometimes they align mm -hmm. and that's a bad bad day or a bad week or a bad month you know depending on which phase of your withdrawal you're in when those things line up it's terrible but most of them uh, it's I, I was never able to correlate a lot of those symptoms with with anything now late in this process. You know, I just told you caffeine and exercise and excitation, all these things. Uh, but earlier in the process, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It, it was just suffering. Hmm. OK, great. that's that is a really helpful overview um, to kind of hear to hear that inventory of symptoms and it's very similar to, to a lot of the, the folks that I see. I, I just think it's useful for people to hear that. Um, you know, moving things along, um, you know, there's a whole nother side of this that I wanted to talk to you about, which was, I, I guess, your experience with psychedelics, because I know they helped you cope. It was almost like a turning point for you in, in your journey from, from my understanding. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about... Um, why you decided to try psychedelics um, and then the impact it had on you. Yeah. Um, yeah that's, it gets really interesting. So um, to be fair for full disclosure, you know, when I, when I was younger, I went to a couple of dead shows. Um, yeah. You know, I, I had eaten magic, magic rush mushrooms maybe once or twice, you know, as a teenager, uh, I tried LSD a couple times. Uh, you know, once in college, once in high school, you know, and stuff. But but that was recreational. Um, and by the way, I wasn't a fan of that stuff mostly. Um, it was a little too much. It, it can be pretty intense, and it lasts a long time. And uh, you know, I'm a I'm an intensity seeker, so that did something for me. But that that was never anything I was in danger of, you know, fully embracing. Mm -hmm. You know, certainly I spent 20 years on active duty and, you know, I had a security clearance and, you know, all this stuff, uh, you know, didn't touch anything like that. I mean, that was a you know, four versions ago of me when I was, you know, was in the military. So, um, you know, after I got out of the military, um, you know, I, I told you I was in that toxic relationship that, that led to that panic attack. You know, that woman uh, used a lot of marijuana. Um, she was self-medicating. She had she had all kinds of problems. Uh, she used a lot of marijuana, so that was you know introduced to me at that point. Um, and I used it on and off uh, while while she was around. Uh, it's hard to do that when you're living with someone mm -hmm. who does that. It's hard to av avoid that. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you, once I got her out of my life, uh, you know, I stopped all. Um, so you know, I didn't want to have want to smoke marijuana. I, don't, I want to do any of that stuff. I want to build my business. I want to play with kids. So, uh, you know, I'm fairly innocent at, at this point is, is around these things and uh, a little skeptical um, about this stuff. Uh, remember, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, you know, I'm a fighter mm -hmm. pilot. I'm an analytical guy. Uh, so embracing, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff that I can't measure or touch or, or see is, is difficult for me but um yeah so i had been off of the diazepam for maybe six months um when one of my buddies called me up and said hey man this guy we both know he's a, a, a former f8 f18 pilot we knew from the, the navy uh this guy's name is Wiz, Wiz buckley he uh had his own story, but he ended up down in Mexico 
uh, at this place that was called Nouvelle V Neurogenesis. Uh, it's now called Ambio Life Sciences. Uh, and that's run by uh, Trevor uh, Millar and Jonathan Dickinson. These, these guys are pretty well known in the psychedelic community, especially around Ibogaine uh, and 5-MeO-DMT, which are, uh, you know, the medicines they use in their protocol down there. But, uh, you know, a whole bunch of seals have been going down there for a while, several hundred of them at that point. Um, and it was kind of their thing inside the SEAL community. And, you know, Marcus Capone, he, he's got a great story. If you look, look him up, he's a SEAL that, uh, you know, started vets, uh, veterans exploring treatment solutions. He and his wife, uh, who I've met, by the way, and are great people. Um, you know, he, he figured out how to save himself with this psychedelic treatment. And, you know, he came running back to his community and said, all right, boys, here it is. And he, he they found a way. So they, they fund these guys and they're streaming down there. Now they've, you know, well over, I'm guessing probably 12 or 1300 guys have been through that program. Um, so I ended up listening to Wiz's story on YouTube when he got back and he talked about how effective this treatment was. I mean, it was profoundly effective. You know, one guy walks in a few days later and different points out. Now he didn't have a benzodiazepine story. This was just a more typical PTSD story as substance abuse, just kind of off the shelf uh, stuff, but it worked brilliantly for him. So one of my buddies who knows him saw this, this thing said, Oh my God, slider, you know, great candidate. He calls me up and said, dude, look at, look at Wiz's video. So I went and watched Wiz's video because Wiz is a guy from the fighter Navy fighter community or strike fighter community. Um, and a guy, I, I didn't know him well, but I you know, knew of him. I'd been in fights with him and we fought him. You know, when I was an instructor, we would take students and he was an adversary and we would fight and we would together. So I kind of knew the guy, you know, he, he's not crazy. Uh, he's a you know, legitimate professional. To hear him tell that story said to me that, okay, this might be legit. Um, now, at this point, remember, I haven't been off the diazepam caper for a long time. I'm still having a lot of physical symptoms, but I've come a long way with that. And what I was seeing as the physical symptoms resolved is they uncovered all the unprocessed traumas that were underneath this whole thing the whole time and then the reason it got there, right? So none of that stuff was being processed. I wasn't facing it. I mean, I really wasn't thinking about it, just suffering so every from moment to moment i mean just that was way out left field but this stuff started to emerge and you know it was impossible for me to tell how much of my hyper excitation my hyperactivity my cognitive follow these things I, i've listed how much of that is lingering physiological damage and how much of it is psycho-emotional there's just there wasn't really a way to tease tease that out but i suspected that you know that psycho-emotional component had become significant at that point. So I, I went to vets and they uh, set me up with new Velvi and I went down there. It's a five day program. Uh, it was one of the best things that that's ever happened to me uh, in my life. I put it right up there behind, uh, you know, my, my wedding and the birth of my kids. I mean, it was that big and, you know, I've done a whole bunch of podcasts. I, I know you've listened to some. I go into that in great detail. I mean, there's six or seven hours of detail on this this stuff out there. But you know, to summarize it, um, it was like a five day luxury spa vacation. Uh, you know, the the accommodations were, were excellent. The staff was amazing. The medical staff was amazing counselors, the, the guides, the, you know, the medicine people. I mean, they were amazing. The chef was amazing. I mean, they just take you into this place. And I'll tell you, you walk in and there's something very special about these people. And, you know, I, I went through a subsequent tr treatment later in another place called The Mission Within, uh, run by Dr. Martin Polanco, who's an amazing man. Um, and, and his staff is the same way. These things are, are very comparable. Uh, and it's my understanding that you know, all the, most of these places are like that. It sounds like there might be some shady people to, to avoid, but, you know, the legitimate ones are all like this. 
these are people who are very far down their journey to to fulfillment and and personal enlightenment growth uh these are very spiritual people um you feel it you walk into these places and and these people are just um i mean they are masters of of openness and 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 love and and peace and healing and you just walk in there and you feel it i mean this is amazing stuff what what they have put together is absolutely amazing so um you know there's a couple of weeks of counseling that you have to do in preparation for these experiences and and, you know some of that's explaining how the medicine works uh what you're going to experience when you're there uh picking apart the reasons that you think you need this treatment uh setting expectations uh what are my intentions what am i going in there trying trying to heal all these steps are very very these all go to mindset um, and in the psychedelic medicine space, they always talk about set and setting. These these are the keys. So, you know, if I run into a Grateful Dead concert and throw a handful of mushrooms down, down my throat, then the, mm-hmm. the music sounds great and the colors are cool and I dance around and it's it's a lot of fun. But that's that's not what this is. This is about doing some pretty courageous stuff. I mean, you, you've really got to be honest and, and open yourself up and look inside and, and, and spill your guts out. Or, or you should. You need to at least be willing to do it, which is, I think, what what writing the intentions uh, does. And so that gets your mindset right. So when you're walking in there, you've already had a couple of weeks of, you know, resolving that that I'm going to do some serious work here, that I'm putting other things aside. And this is I'm going deep. I'm focusing on me because that's what the medicine does is it is it allows you to see yourself very, very clear. Um, so you're going in there, you're already kind of primed for this. So when you walk in, you're very receptive to the the nature of these people. And, you know, they would call them vibrations or energy. I, I think that's a thing. You know, I understand that, that, uh, that lingo. Um, it's real. And, you know, I was very skeptical of things like that before I went in there, but I walked in there and I, I remember the, you know, after a couple hours, I looked at the other guys. I'm like, these people are amazing. I mean, I've never met people like this before. And they all agreed. And I hear this over and over again. So, you know, these are folks who have done the work themselves and really have something to offer to, to, to folks who are, are lost. Um, so anyway, you go in there, uh, you know, there's a lot of getting comfortable and, 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 you know, you spend time talking to the guys and just sitting around in a circle and, and discussing your lives and telling your stories and getting to know each other and all these things. And, uh, you know, then comes the Iba game. So do you want to talk about what Ibogaine is or should we? No, no. I, I think if people are interested in it, they can, they could look it up themselves. I think uh, uh, I would like to, yeah, focus kind of on your experience taking it and um, how that, um, you know, what, what you took away from it. Yeah. yeah very well. Okay. So there's, yeah. you know, these, these plant med- there's this broad category yeah. of plant medicines or entheogens and entheogenic medicines yeah. which you know mean bringing you closer to god I, you know the term psychedelic is mind manifesting uh given the experiences i've had on these things i would say and theogenic is probably a more accurate uh descriptor um you know ibogaine is the big daddy um yeah. psilocybin mushrooms uh as, as a matter of fact in in you know the indigenous peoples who use these things they call ibogaine grandfather Grandfather yeah. is is can be stern, <laughs> you know. Ibogaine is the big daddy. There's there's uh, you know psilocybin mushrooms. Those are those are called uh, you know grand grandmother, or you can okay. use ayahuasca. You know there are organizations. Heroic Hearts is a big one. They're very big on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is they call that mother, um, and these are just basically levels of oh. How much these things take you apart when you when you do these experiences so, so the, the ivy game is very much the big daddy but you know there's some others out there that i haven't listed but but those are the big ones um so what did i experience so you know you take this medicine uh and it's and it's ceremonial there's you know tradition behind that stuff i mean this stuff has been around for a long long time some of it going back you know many thousands of years um so there's some kind of shamanic ritual around it, you know, traditional things. And, and you know, 
at first, I thought, oh, this is tourist stuff. Believe me, I, I'm the ultimate skeptic with this stuff. So this is why I, I love to mm -hmm. talk about it because I, I was completely wrong. That stuff is important. That goes to your set and your, and your setting. Uh, but you do all that stuff. And so when you really get into it, what you're really doing with the Ibogaine is you're laying on a bed, uh, plastered to the bed. You, moving is, is a big challenge. Uh, well, wow. you're conscious. Uh, yeah. You are conscious. Um, but I would characterize it, and many do, as a waking dream. So you have eye shades on. You can't see complete blackout shades. You're laying on your back. You don't move, and everything happens inside your mind. Um, you know, I talk about it at length. Uh, I said you don't want me to go into great detail about the, you know, what I saw or, or anything. Do you, or just more like what the experience was like? I think so. We got about. I think half an hour actually, uh, and and so I think we could talk about it a little bit. Um, so I'll I'll, 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 I'll talk about go. some highlights. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we call that the the trip report. And let me just caution before I, I say this part. Uh, you know, there's been a lot in the, in the media about psychedelics. So how to change your mind with the Poland's book, the, the Netflix series. Uh, that Rachel Yehuda did after that and all that. So this stuff is out there. I mean, people are hearing about it. Um, the trip reports are cool. Like it's a lot of fun. It's good entertainment. I, if I was a filmmaker, I'd love to do a, you know, a short about particularly my first Ibogaine journey. It was just completely spectacular IMAX experience. Um, so all that's cool. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of important things that happened during that phase of it, but that's 14 hours. You know, here I am, you know, coming up on two years after my first Ibogaine experience. And I can tell you that the work happens afterwards. Um, so the point I want to make is listen to this because it's cool and it has value. But what these modalities are, what these treatments really do is they kick the door open. They show you yourself in a way that you've never seen yourself yourself before and it's brutally honest and beautiful and it's beautiful because it's so honest it's so apparently true you see what you do to yourself with with these stories you tell yourself this narrative this this uh this inner voice you, your default mode network you know carries this self-talk and your self-talk is the most dangerous thing in the world because if it gets good in, in, in a harmful way i mean it's you or at least it feels like you, you know, it's very internal. And so that's a, that, that's a tough, tough fight. So I just want to say that it kicks the door open uh, on a neurochemical level. There's, there's enhanced neuroplasticity for some time after this experience. And that's when you do your integration work. This is when you change your habits, the way you think, the, the things you do, your morning routine, uh, the way, just the way you look at things. We'll get into that in a second, but I, I want to be very, very clear that this is not a magic pill. People say all the time, I came back a completely different person. That is true. But if you just come back and keep doing the same stuff you were doing, well, within some months, you're just going to be the same person again. You've really got to use it as an opportunity to do some some serious personal work. And you, you need to commit time and energy to this. And the people around you need to be supportive of it. And you need to understand this because it's an ongoing process. With that said, here's what happened. Now, remember that you know, I said entheogen, so we're talking about God and, and ex existential frameworks and, you know, quantum physics and the nature of consciousness and all this crazy stuff that comes out when you, mm -hmm. start, when you get around psychedelics. I, I didn't go in there looking for any of that. I was vaguely aware that, that all that was a thing. I, I really just needed to feel better because I had just been in hell for so long and I was freaked out and, and my life sucked. So I didn't go down there looking for this. I did not carry this in there with me in any way. But here's what happened. So as this medicine came on, uh, you know, I started getting some crazy visuals. I, ha I have my blinds on, uh, you know, there's all this music and it's very, it's music that's very specific to uh, these types of medicines. A lot of, uh, you know, weedy tribal music, those are the, that's the, that's the uh, folks that, are kind of the keepers of, of iboga 
um, you know, Johns Hopkins has a psilocybin soundtrack that they've developed in the last 15 or, or, or so years. So the, the music, the vibration, that is very important. And there's very specific types of, of, of sounds and music that, that enhance this experience. But as, as the visual experience started to come on, I started to see softly pulsating colors that were synced with the rhythm and all that stuff. And they became more and more intense uh, over time. And then all of a sudden, faces started coming out of the mist at me. Um, and it was weird because they were recognizable human faces, but they appeared to be carved in stone. Like, think of like the, the statues on Easter Island. They kind of looked like that, mm -hmm. except they were light brown. So it was very weird. But these these faces started coming out of the mist towards me. And there's a lot of, you know, probably, a, you know, over an hour or so, maybe 60, 70 of these things. And as each one emerged from the mist, it delivered a message to me. Remember, these are people I knew. These are family members who are people close to me. I wasn't summoning them. They just appeared. And each one of them delivered a message to me. And their lips weren't moving. They were stone. There was no sound. But the message was very clear. Each one of them came to me and gave me a message uh, along the lines of, I love you. Everything's going to be okay. You have nothing to fear. Um, and, and I mean that on the largest possible scale, uh, you know, on an eternal scale, or at least the scale of a human life. I mean, I got this message that, okay, and each one was delivered to me in a different way that had something to do with that particular person's personality or my relationship with them. But the, the theme was the same. It was very consistent. And so I started getting that. And I'll tell you that it, the relief I felt, I mean, it just disarmed me. It was good. This was a strange but but beautiful experience, and there's a lot of feeling in it too. I just felt peace. It was great, and so after a little bit of that, I found that I could control what I was seeing, and so I started going, "Well, what about this guy? What about that guy?" I went all the way through my life to my earliest childhood friends I, I had known, with kids I'd played with when I was five years old. And every day I went through my whole life. And I could, anyone I wanted would come to me and they all delivered a similar message. So, I, you know, I did that. All. But somewhere during that period of all these faces coming to visit me, I think I reached what they, what they call the peak of the experience. Now, I laid there for 14 hours. <laughs> there was a lot and way more than we can possibly talk about here. But the peak happens, you know, one to two hours into it, I think. And I, I believe that at the peak, this is what happened to me. And this one chunk was the bulk of the healing, I think, from this first experience I had. And, and it's ineffable, but I'll try. Um, almost in a flash, at some point here, the truth of all things was shown to me. That is a very big statement. Uh, and I don't mean that, you know, the fabric of the universe or, or what was before the big bang. I don't mean on that level. I mean, the truth of all things in, in my life were shown to me. And it's not like I watched a movie. It was almost like it was delivered to me psychically in one massive truckload, just all of the sudden, I saw very clearly too many things to list. Everything about myself, all the ways that my self-talk was harmful, uh, messages I've received from my parents that were not the messages they intended to transmit, things I believed about myself because of experiences I've had, um, you know, why my personality is the way I am, why I see the world the way I do, what what went wrong in my marriage? What what did it really mean that this horrible thing happened in Iraq? My relationships with my kids. I was struggling with my younger son. I talk about that. It was a podcast. I talked about that for like an hour. All these nuances of, of my relationship with my father, how I'd internalize those messages, how I was passing those along to my son. That's called generational trauma. I didn't know anything about generational trauma. I might have even told you that that's kind of BS. <laughs> It's not. It was revealed to me instantly. I went, oh, my God, it's so clear what I'm doing here. All these things. 
So that's the nature of things that was revealed to me. I, I could talk for hours about how much stuff was revealed to me. But if I had to wrap it up in a, in a little bundle, I would say the truth of all things was revealed to me in a flash. The veracity of it was apparent and undeniable and, and of a proportion that, you know, I can't describe. It was just the truth bright white light my chest was cracked open all of me was poured out on a, on a you know call it a, a an operating room table with big <laughs> lights on it and we just got to look at it and pick through it and and i understood it we think about that from a from a therapeutic standpoint i mean how many years do you have to spend on the couch to to get that maybe never <laughs> i mean that was a decade of of intense psychotherapy right there you know, the rest of my experience was much more visual. Um, you know, that was the emotional, the profound emotional insight was right there. The rest of it for many hours was some of the coolest stuff you could ever talk about. This is why I would love to make a short film about it. You know, I found I was able to travel in time uh, and in space. So I went, you know, to various places around the earth at various periods in history to the Mayan temples and mm -hmm. the, the Great Pyramids and the and the you know the Parthenon and and the Circus Maximus and all these things you know I watched Genghis Khan and all that I just saw all these crazy things I'm like I got a tour of world history and geography it was crazy and then at some point you know I was able to go where and when I, I wanted to I, I it, it was very real to me. You know, people talk about these experiences. They say it was more real than real. Spent a lot of time reading and thinking about that. I think I might understand why that is. But it was very real. You know, I was standing there. I was there. Standing at, a, at you know, this temple watching sacrifices happen, right? I mean, I was there. It was bizarre. Nobody could see me. Nobody interacted with me. I could feel... Uh, and hear everything people were thinking. It was it was weird. I could see all the way around. I had like 360 vision. It was, it was crazy. It was like I was there just as an impartial observer. It was, it, it was nuts. Um, after that, there was a period where the, the my travels kind of took on their own life. I wasn't directing this, but at some point I, you know, went to, to some altitude, maybe 20, 30,000 feet based on, you know, the footprint that i could see underneath me it was like i was flying um it wasn't physical though it was weird it was my mind like i could just see from that vantage point and you know i looked around the world i got to see the whole globe i i, I came to understand the size of the human population relative to other things on the earth uh i came to see that that everything's connected that we're all part of a a, a system uh you know on a sub molecular level i i, I just you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about quantum physics here, but this is something I've become very interested in, like understanding how everything is, what is the fabric of everything? I think I had a glimpse of that. It's very strange. There were times when I, you know, I went to New York, right? So here I am flying over New York at 20,000 feet. And all of a sudden I started zooming down into neighborhoods, like the fastest zoom you can imagine, like and I'm there and I'm in a neighborhood, then I'm in a building and then I'm individual apartments. And I could, I could go around and look at people's lives like they're like they're like they had no roof on their places. Guy arguing with his wife, kid playing with his dog, you know, mom making dinner, whatever. I just saw all these just normal mundane life stuff. And it and it went got faster and faster and faster. And I saw that and I just came to understand how, how human life is teeming on this planet and all this. It was just a strange viewpoint that I'd never had. Um, and after quite a bit of that, I was able to leave the planet. I went to the moon. I, I, I watched the moon and the earth and the sun all in alignment. I was out in space watching this stuff. And I went, this is crazy. I'm in space. And so now I, you know, I've been interested in astronomy even casually my whole life, a little cosmology and all this science guy. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I'm like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to see how much I can explore. So I explored our solar system. I, I explored our galaxy. I went outside our galaxy. I saw the web of galaxies that is our universe. I mean, I just went further and further and further and back. And 
uh, based on no science whatsoever, just something I saw, our universe does have limits. Picking apart <laughs> why we have these experiences is a it, that's a big job. We're you know we just can't get there. We don't understand the nature of consciousness and how the brains work. Yeah, you know, w was this all synthetic? Was it manufactured in my own imagination and fed into my visual cortex? There's there's you know plenty of science that suggests that's what it is. But I can tell you from an experience experiential standpoint. I think my consciousness was expanded and I was able to perceive things that are always there. We just can't normally perceive. That's what the experience told me. These two things are at odds with one, one another and with my skepticism, which is still present. So this mm -hmm. is my current fascination, trying to figure out why these experiences are there. I got to the limits of our universe. And I said, can I leave our universe? I left our universe. I went outside our universe. All of a sudden our universe was this bubble it was the snow globe i could see the whole thing and i was outside of it. it it didn't really have a skin but had, had limits and i could see and i was able to leave those limits and then the space outside our universe was was very different than the space inside our universe um there was a kind of a hum to it a, a, a low just kind of a, an energy just like a vibration and it felt and you know in that state when I heard that and it felt that vibration, I went, oh, this is the fundamental fabric of all things. You, you know, multiple universes are rendered out of this through the creators. Well, I know this sounds crazy, dude. You know, we're talking about a psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. here. Okay. Just, I mean, it sounds nice. I'm just telling you what I experienced. Um, and so this is what I'm thinking about this stuff. And then all of a sudden I turn, just realized my 360 vision was gone at this point. Interesting. I'd never thought about that before, but I did have to turn and I realized that I was actually floating in dead space between nodes in this cubic lattice of universes. An infinite lattice. I could see in every direction, endless instances of, of our universe, other universes. I don't know. The quantum physicists had some guesses about that, but I saw it and I went, oh my God, there are infinite universes. I want to see what's in the next universe over. So I tried to go over there and I couldn't go. There was like an invisible barrier. Bizarre. Why? Is that a limit of my imagination? I don't think it is at this point. Why couldn't I go there? No idea. So there's one little mm -hmm. sliver of something that makes me go, is this just an imagination? Was there a real elevation of consciousness here that allowed me to perceive something different I, I don't know i don't know the answer i can tell you it was very very real you know i eventually returned to our planet and you know there's a yeah. part in there i was a screaming eagle you know hauling down a mountain <laughs> you know i was playing with water i was able to pick up water and there was one point where i had an interaction with the guy next to me he, he taps me on the shoulder and i look at him he goes what were you just doing with your hands i'm like oh i had a ball of water and i was you know i thought i was mm -hmm. floating this orb of water and and he goes, so was I. <laughs> like, I <just> <laughs> so then we share, you know, we pick our eye shades up. When you pick your eye shades up, it's interesting. The real world's still there. Yeah. It looks different. It's it's kind of weird looking, but it's the real world and you feel safe. And you can see that the medical personnel are there and you're in the building. The other guys are fine. And you, you can come in and out of it. You put your eye shades down, boop, you're right, right back in that world. But we compared notes for a minute and you know, he was having a similar experience. I mean, what does that mean? You know, mm -hmm. Were we somehow sharing an experience? I mean, think about the implications of that. I mean, that would be validation of the most difficult to believe way of looking at all this stuff. Fascinating. You know, I see now why the CIA did all these weird experiments back in, in this. So like, mm -hmm. I, I get it now. It, it actually wasn't that crazy. If you've experienced this, then you're going to go, well, is there more to it? I mean, a, a, a scientific mind is, is going to want to inquire. But, Mark, let me let me jump in here because I want to make sure that we we get to this. I um because we have about fifteen minutes left. So after your trip, um, tell me, you know, what were your your your, your your what withdrawal symptoms like? Um, what was your PTSD like? What tell me about the aftermath of this? The benzodiazepines. Yes, let's get back to why we're here. So yeah. Again, my apology. I mean, this is exciting stuff, and, and there's many hours of content that look that up if 
you're interested, but they ask about GABA receptors because one of the big things with the Ibogaine, you know, the way it, it that we've discovered it and outside of the cultures where it's indigenous is uh, in treatment of heroin addicts. So the, uh, the Ibogaine has a unique property that other psychedelics do not have in that they reset opioid receptors. So these people who are diehard heroin addicts are going to these treatments, one Ibogaine session, 80% success rate. These people walk out, no cravings, no withdrawal. They're done. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff, the psycho-emotional healing that, you know, nobody says, I want to be an addict that just starts using drugs. I mean, there's a path that gets you there. Uh, you know, it's, it's you're overwhelmed by pain. <laughs> it's generally what it is, or traumas, or things you just can't, you know, that's how you get there. So, you know, knowing that there's a, a receptor reset component to this, I asked Jonathan Dickinson, who's, who's kind of their science guy down there, I, I asked him if, if this would reset GABA receptors. And you know what answer I was looking for, and I, I didn't get that answer. He said, no, some people have looked at that. It does nothing for resetting your GABA receptors. So the joy and the peace that you feel in a couple of days after that on the beginning experience are so powerful that they could easily mask the physical symptoms. So I suspect my physical symptoms were there but you're you're pretty euphoric for a couple of days like i certainly wouldn't make any big life decisions a couple of weeks of one of these experiences that, that could go badly for you but um i would say that my benzodiazepine my physical symptoms were not affected in any way after some weeks i, I would say they were absolutely right back where they were however my ability to recognize the symptoms, to recognize their onset earlier, to recognize patterns of thoughts that led me to anxiety and stress and more suffering. I became very tuned into all that stuff right away. And by recognizing it early, I gave myself a better chance of, of mitigating things. And the techniques were there. This wasn't I didn't read a book or go to a class or anything. I just innately all of a sudden had this ability to remember that peace that I felt during the experience. To remember that that's available to me and to remember that everything's going to be okay. And that and that's on a very spiritual, you know, eternal level. Remember, I was not a spiritual guy going into there. I am now. There is more to this this life. And so the knowing that your path, no matter how difficult, has a purpose, that there is a reason you're here, that this is a, a classroom or or maybe it's a vacation. I don't know. I mean, God, you know, hopefully when we pass, God's gonna explain all this to us. You know, how could you know that if you're not dead? But it, it seems like that's what it is to me. Uh, and it was so powerful, so profound that I walk around with a deck. Matter of fact, I wear this thing now. The reason for mm -hmm. that is to remind myself, you know, I look at this and I go, there is a purpose. There is something bigger here than just your life. So, you know, having that existential framework to having that big understanding to, that something awful might actually be good um, was really, really helpful to me. And everyone who knows me would, has told me you came back a different guy. I'm calmer. My ability to handle stress, well, still tremendously reduced because the benzodiazepine damage is way better than it was before the experience. The patience with people, um, my ability to listen. I mean, just all kinds of, of things that that collectively I would take as you know peace and harmony. Uh, just vibing with the world. I, there's lots of ways to say it. I'm just, I'm down off the ledge. Uh, and the benzos put everybody on the ledge. Can, can I ask you, Mark, because I think I, I'd, I'd love to hear your answer to this. What was the meaning that you found in your suffering? I mean, um... that's a good question. So uh, 
I'm, I'm just going to lay it out there because this mm -hmm. is what happened. This is the truth. Um, you know, I did have a second Ibogaine experience, and I don't know if you, you listened to that one, but that was not mm -hmm. the IMAX tour of, of all the of existence. That one was a very personal interaction with our creator, uh, who I call God when I re refer to this. It was very, very personal. I mean, I had a direct conversation with our creator. Uh, and when I was told or shown, it's hard to say. I mean, these aren't words, remember this. I mean, it's it's like psychic communication. I don't know how else to say it, but these messages are delivered. And, what, and, and God's message to me was, I am always here. I love you with no bounds. You can't do anything wrong. Suffering is imposed upon you, is placed on your path because I know you can get through it. And, it's, and it is through enduring that suffering that you come back to me, that you come to learn that compassion and love are what we need to heal, to be happy, to, to be fulfilled in this life. And when you start living your life like that, when you start walking around grateful for that you're alive, we don't understand the nature of consciousness. You know, I, I'm a beast. I go out and run in the morning. My runs are very different. When I run down the boardwalk in the morning, I, you know, I feel my heart pumping, my lungs burning, my legs churning, all this stuff. And I almost always think I'm, I'm in, in this beast. It's really cool. I'm an animal. I can flesh and bones and teeth and skull and ah, and it's really awesome. What a weird thing to think. I didn't used to think like that. I go out for a run. I'm like, I'm a beast. What a gift this body is. I want to take care of this body. I want it to be strong and healthy. It's a gift. I want to see what I can do with it. This is awesome. I mean, I just didn't used to think of that. I look at the clouds and I go, what a beautiful place God has put here for us to, to live this physical life. I never used to notice beauty in anything. In fact, I was looking for an enemy. I was looking for somebody to fight. Totally different. So when you start viewing everything like that, you, you become unflappable. It's much harder to get me upset now. Really hard. As a matter of fact, I, I'm fascinated when I watch people get angry and yell and rant about things and all this. I, I watch them with detached curiosity. And I, I find myself saying, you know, what's missing in their life? What, what message did that person not receive correctly? Or what, what incorrect perception do they have about themselves? Because we're all, this, we're all the same. We're all part of this creation. It's all beautiful. It's all a gift, right? This is very, very soft stuff. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like that before. Now I don't run around, you know, saying this stuff all day, but internally I'm, you know, when I, when I come up against something that would have been difficult for me in the past, I have this way of looking at it. It makes it okay. It's huge value. So if you were to quantify it and I know it's really difficult, your, I mean, your symptoms out of 10, where were they? The withdrawal symptoms, where were they before the experience? And where were they, say, you know, two months after the experience, after the euphoria had died down and such? How would you quantify, I guess, the difference in your... Well, I know the symptoms were there, so maybe a better way to phrase that is your ability to tolerate them. How how greatly did that change? Right. Um, yeah, and I was going to ask you, what's my baseline? Because, you know, when, my, when I was foaming at the mouth and... and cold water was running through my hair and, and electrical zaps i would call that 11 okay. <laughs> you know for my, for my symptoms uh on a scale on a 10 scale um you know from that perch uh where was i about that time with my physical symptoms yeah, maybe a four well okay and by the way oh. four is bad yeah, yeah. If you're a normal, healthy person walking around and I suddenly quantum leap you to four on this scale, you're in the worst hell you've ever known. 
Okay, just just to be clear, mm-hmm. when people become what they're able to adapt to going through these bends as a peak straw, it, it's amazing. I mean, people who tough this out deserve a lot. And I'm patting myself on the back, I know. But if you're listening to this and you're going through this, you're a hero. I mean, it takes incredible will to to survive to to get through this stuff. Um, and everybody can, everybody can. But yeah, maybe a four, but. You know, the way I was acting, my psychology, my my emotional state, um, you know, the way I interacted with people that that's, that's uh, apparently psychological. You know, I'd just been that way for so long. I, I It was just my way. So how far did I come on that path, I think, is what you're asking me. Let's, let's recalibrate. Let's, let's say if if I was at a 10 the day I walked into the medicine. I was at a at a five when we walked out. And what's interesting is I went a second time six months later to Dr. Polanco's place, the mission within, and it's because we were shooting a documentary about this stuff. And you know, part of me felt a little guilty. I'm going, well, I'm going down there to do a documentary. I'm, I'm taking a spot that you know, a veteran who's who, whose life might be saved by this is you know could make better use of. Um, I was wrong. Uh, so if I was at a five walking in that second time, six months later, I was probably at a three or four walking out. That it's was incredible. A yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you still think you have PTSD? I guess that constellation of, of symptoms uh, now, or do you think, I don't know. It's like if, if someone did a clinical interview with you and they said, you know, you know, are you irritable? Are you persistently negative do you get re uh, do you relive experiences do you have bad dreams do you um i guess yeah yeah the, do you um startle easily like if they ask you the classic clinical diagnostics for ptsd do you think you'd still meet them today Ninety percent of the time no not even close no there are days and it, you know, it's if I have four or five really stressful, really full days where I, I, you know, just have to go, go, go from thing to thing to thing that I'm able to do that as a miracle. But, you know, I am able to do that from time to time, but four or five days of that, I will get worked up into it, into the bad place again, a little bit, nothing like it, it used to be. But again, I see it coming. And this is a huge one. I say, oh man, I'm, I'm like getting worked up. I'm starting to, you know, my thoughts are starting to ping pong. I'm, I'm feeling stress and impatient. I recognize it very early and I'm able to take a breath. Um, now I said, you know, some of the technique I use for that is just very internal. Um, you know, but I've also introduced some other things during my integration phase. Uh, you know, I started doing yoga. Um, it's helpful. Uh, I meditate twice a day, uh, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, twice a day. I do transcendental meditation, by the way, you know, I tried to do mindful meditation on and off through the years of withdrawal. Uh, that's about the hardest thing in the world to ask someone going through benzo withdrawal to do. I mean, you're saying, you know, calm your mind. Well, that's, that's the problem, right? See, it's a very direct approach. I'm, I'm just going to calm my mind. You don't have much success at least I didn't while I was going through the, the taper and withdrawal. Um, however, the act of trying has meaning and, and it was good. And I you know, kept trying on and off. I, you know, at that time, I would have said I was very unsuccessful. I realized that meditation is not something you have successful or, or unsuccessful sessions. And it's a, that you're doing it is the success, right? So when you come back from these, uh, from the psychedelic experiences, particularly if you're doing transcendental meditation, you have these insane sessions. Uh, I mean, you just go deep right away to reach that state of consciousness, that, that deep calm where your you know, sense of self begins to dissolve and you just feel this, this massive peace. By the way, the 5-MeO-DMT causes that too. So having had that 5-MeO-DMT experience, which we haven't even talked about, um, it's like the best meditation anyone's ever had. And once you've had that, well, now you go back into your, you know, your sessions, you wake up in the morning and 
drink some water, whatever you sit down and, and go to go to your session, you just go right there. And that's amazing. So when you, when you can get there, well, now you're saying I'm not using a medication or drug or a plant or, you know, anything. This is just me. This is me walking around stone cold sober. I have discovered this techniques that allows me to reach this blissful state of consciousness. Well, now I understand why these Tibetan monks go sit cross-legged in a yurt for two years. Because when you can get your mind there, when you have disciplined yourself to do that, that's 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 a ton of healing. I mean, just just being able to come in and out of that space, you, even a few minutes of it, you come out and you're totally different. Especially if it's the PTSD symptoms, it just works like a champ. I hate to say this, but I but we need to wrap now. Um, I just want to say thank you for sharing your story, and I mean, you have lived a really inter interesting life from kind of going to the military to 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 all the trauma that you went through to to being i guess in on the fringe of kind of medicine and hopefully it's not fringe for long but i mean you've your your life has certainly been an adventure so thank you for sharing that i, I think it's going to be really helpful for um people listening to this yeah absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. um you know thanks for having me on doc i i appreciate it um you know, I know where your heart and your, your head are on this from some other conversations we've had. Uh, you know, we need more guys like you, credentialed people, uh, you know, come learning about this stuff, understanding it, uh, interacting with the patient. So you, so you really understand how it works because this stuff shouldn't be illegal. I mean, it's an absolute national embarrassment that our most highly trained warriors have to go out of the country for medical care. The, Safe and effective medical, highly safe and effective medical care. I mean, can you think of another modality that has an 80% success rate on anything? And it's inexpensive. I mean, look at what the VA spent. We've got to fix this problem. It's wrong that this stuff was illegal in the first place. Uh, you know, if you're interested in it, you have to read How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. I mean, that's just the, the, absolutely the primer. And it explains how we got here. This is something that has to be fixed. But I'll tell you this, there's enough credible people who've had these experiences or going around and talking about things like this now that I, I think it's going to happen. It's not mm -hmm. time to ease up because there are plenty of forces out that don't want this to happen. Um, big Pharma. And uh, <laughs> I think there's enough of a movement that we're going to get there. So, you know, the next step is, is you know, legislation needs to happen. We need to have... Uh, you know, training in place. We, we, doctors need to understand how this stuff works, what the what the hazards are, what the controls need to cool. be. Um, you know, we need we need well trained practitioners and a, and a good safe system around it. But the, this treatment needs to, needs to happen, and I, and I think it will. I mean, hopefully, we've got the bellwether coming up. Um, Maps is uh, going for uh, uh, FDA uh, approval um, for MDMA for PTSD. On the heels of that, we've got groups like Compass and USONA who are bringing psilocybin to the market for depression. Several companies, a lot of biotechs, uh, US-based uh, biotechs and um, foreign are also developing things like 5-MeO DMT, you know, Ibogaine. There is a lot of work happening here at the moment to make this stuff mainstream. And so uh, everyone's going to be watching maps and, and seeing what happens at the end of this year, because if that gets through, uh, it will be a renaissance, a whole new wave of treatments. Uh, so much in drug regulation is precedent. And so if they let one through, it's a lot more likely that uh, others will be able to follow that same path to approval. So it's a really exciting time. The one other thing I want to say is uh, if you made it this far in this interview, and it was a long one, and, and if you have protracted withdrawal from either a benzodiazepine or an antidepressant or, or maybe just uh, you know PTSD without those things, and you've tried any of these psychedelic treatments, please leave comments in the section below. Um, we're not just interested in positive reviews. Tell me if you had a really bad experience. We want all of them. So uh, your experience is uh, really useful. So so yeah, thank, thank you for watching. Slider, thank you so much for coming on. Any final words before we wrap? 
Yeah. One thing, if you're going through benzodiazepine withdrawal right now, or if you have PTSD, uh, you know, if you're living under, under an overpass, you know, whatever, don't give up. Please just don't give up. If you're suicidal, dial 988. Okay. If you're interested in, in psychedelic therapy, I mean, Google is your friend. There's it's, it's everywhere. You can find it, find some help, get some help and just don't give up because you can get through this. You can, everything you need to get through it is, is here. Ask for help. It's okay to be broken. Ask for help, get fixed. And when you learn how to do it, when you learn how to repair yourself and give it back, just that, you know, that's what we're doing right here. Mm -hmm. Say, Hey, it's okay. You can find your help. And, and more and more people start thinking like that than this 44 a day or, or 22 a day or wherever it, the, the range of veteran suicides is right now, that number, that number decreases. And it's not just veterans. You know, veterans are leading, leading the charge on this because it's easy for people to understand. Everybody has trauma. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's something here. This isn't for everyone. It's not. If it's not psychedelic therapy, there's another way. Just don't give up. That's the most important message. Please don't give up. Okay. Well, great. On that thought, I'm going to wrap. Thank you again, and you have a great day. Thank you. Okay, bye.